Hi and welcome Year 7 parents. Um, for those new to our college community, a big welcome and for those joining us from across the bridge, welcome over the bridge. My name is Lauren and I'm the college psychologist on the secondary campus at CAC. Um, I am so glad that you're able to join me from the comfort of your own home today or maybe from your office space. Uh, it's unfortunate that we can't meet in person, however it's great that we have the opportunity to still connect in this way. I'm going to be going through um, an overview of some adolescent development information and some tips and ideas to help you prepare for this time um, of parenting your young person. And so if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to email me directly and we will arrange a time to have a conversation. I'm going to do a quick overview of adolescent development, looking specifically at the brain. We're going to talk about a couple of parenting tips and some really helpful messages to send you on your way. A lot of the information I'll be sharing with you today is from various researchers and um, psychological development information. Some of it's from my own clinical experience, but if you have questions and want um, some further information about anything you see, I'm happy to share some resources with you. A favourite quote that I like to use to start this off is that the greatest gifts you can give to your children are the roots of responsibility and the wings of independence. So adolescence is a pretty complicated and tricky time where there's a lot of growth and a lot of changes happening. It is when their bodies are changing. It is when their brains are really developing new intellectual capacities that you will see as their learning gets far more complicated. It's a time when they're starting to become a little bit more abstract and being able to use critical thinking and processing. The demands of school are increasing as they get older, but they're also growing and developing their social capacity and a lot of those um, social communication skills that they will be using and testing on you. There are some really important and key developmental tasks of adolescence that every young person has to go through. It is a time where it's about um, identifying a sense of identity, uh, developing goals for the future, figuring out who they are separate from you as parents, separate from their friends, separate from their peers. It's about building relationships. It's about working through understandings of self-image, which is to do with body image, but also personality. It's about understanding gender and sexuality. It's about understanding and developing their own personal value system that might really align with the family or maybe not, but it's also a big time about gaining behavioural maturity. And in particular with teenagers, we are often talking about impulse control. So as you can see, there is a lot of changes, a lot of things that teenagers are going through, which is why it's hard to parent a teenager. So some things to expect and to know that you are not alone, that when they are adolescents, the friends will always become far more important than family. And not to take it personally, because we've all gone through that phase where we don't always wanna be around our family and that focus on being included and being a part of a group and having friends to connect to becomes vital and important. Um, you will see different changes in behaviour because we're also looking at puberty and different hormonal development at this stage. So you'll see changes in sleep. You'll see some young people going through growth spurts where they cannot get enough food into them and other times where they might not be eating much at all. You will see changes in mood. There will sometimes be mood swings where you'll see some very drastic highs and lows. There might be times when your teenager will not stop talking and there might be times when you are desperately trying just to get a word out of them other than a grunt or a hump as they walk into their room. There, it is a time when they do take risks socially and personally, but it's also a really tricky time because teenagers tend to be very self-conscious and there is a significant awareness about the judgment of others. And that can play a really significant role in the choices that they make and sometimes the things that they do that they shouldn't do, but maybe some of the things that they should do that they choose not out of that sense of concern for what other people might think. There are some really difficult and challenging belief systems that often adolescents will hold that is mostly challenging for parents. It's that concept of seeing a young person who acts like they're invincible and they might take risks that will horrify you. Um, there will be times when they will say to you, you don't understand and they'll believe that no one gets it and all of their feelings are unique. And that's okay to have that feeling and that, um, that concern, but it can be really helpful to work with young people to help them see, hey, you know what? 
a lot of these feelings and experiences you're having are actually quite natural and believe it or not sometimes the adults in your life can actually understand what you might be going through and maybe we've even been through it before so we can be there to help you they will test you they will push you it is your job as a parent of an adolescent to really know where your boundaries are because your adolescent will push them to determine where they are. So if you're not quite sure where your boundaries lie, it's gonna be really tricky because they will push you right over. Whereas if you're really clear on where your boundaries are, where those points are that you're willing to be flexible, what you're prepared to negotiate on, it's gonna be really helpful because then when that pushing happens, you know where and when to stand firm. So it is going to be a time when you are going to be watching things that might make you want to tear your hair out, but it's okay. This is this all has to happen. This is all testing and growth and learning, and it's all part of natural brain development, even though it can be tough as the parent who is weathering the storm with them. It is important that there are extra supports in place for you as parents, but also for your adolescent. When we talk about having a cohesive family, that doesn't necessarily mean just having one household. But what that means is about having a family, regardless of how many households, that can collaborate in the best interests of that adolescent. So there is some consistency and clarity about what the expectations are. It's about, again, having those clear boundaries, setting limits helping your adolescent know that they will push to figure out where those limits are, but it's actually important that they do actually hit those limits and they go, oh, okay, cool. That's where my safe space is. I can test the boundaries within those confines about having healthy modeling of behavior, both from adults in their environment, but also from other peers about as a family, having really clear um, expectations in terms of what are the things that you value? Do you value their focus on school? Do you value a focus on health? You know, are you really clear about what sort of respect and behavioural expectations you have? Having involvement in co-curricular communities, whether it be a church, whether it be a sport, whether it be um, you know, a scout troop, something like that, that is a collaborative, supportive space that your adolescents can go to outside the family home is also really important. And also as parents, making sure that you have backup and support for yourself. Get to know other parents of adolescents. Have people that you can debrief with. Have people that you can go to to share questions and concerns and ideas and have a laugh about the things that you're going to get wrong and you know, have an opportunity to celebrate the things that you get right. Over the last 100 years, adolescent development has changed in the ways that the world works and the influences that adolescents now have. So we used to spend a lot of time with our same gendered parents, but now there are so many other influences where it's mostly time spent with peers. It's not always about in-person interactions. There's a lot of online space that is having a massive influence in adolescent development, behavior and personality. So there's a lot of risk taking that you know, previously it used to be you'd have to take a risk to ask someone out on a date or to ask them for a dance or to, you know, walk home from school or to maybe go to work with a trusted adult and try new things. Whereas now social media plays a really important role in adolescent development. When I say that social media plays an important role, I'm not saying that it plays a vital and positive role necessarily, but it is definitely a significant influencer in how our adolescents are functioning. So there's a lot of information around the risks associated with um, overuse of devices and social media spaces, and it's something that we're constantly having to learn and evolve and adapt and to understand even more as adults to make sure that we can support our young people to make good decisions. This this is a, um, a blog post that was written by Jean Twang and I just wanted to read it to you and you can read along with me. The arrival of the smartphone has radically changed every aspect of teenagers' lives from the nature of their social interactions to their mental health. The correlations between depression and smartphone use are strong enough to suggest that more parents should be telling their kids to put down their phone. As the technology writer Nick Bilton has reported, it's a policy some Silicon Valley executives follow. Even Steve Jobs limited his kids' use of the devices that he brought into the world. For all their power to link kids day and night, social media also exacerbates the age-old teen concern about being left out. Today's teens may go to fewer parties and spend less time together in person, but when they do congregate, they document their, document their hangouts relentlessly on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and those not invited come along, not invited to come along are very keenly aware of it. 
The more time teens spend looking at screens, the more likely they are to report symptoms of depression. Year 8 students, 8th graders, who are heavy, heavy users of social media, increase their risk of depression by 27%, while those who play sports, go to religious services or even do homework more than the average teen, cut their risk of depression significantly. Teens who spend three hours a day or more on electronic devices are 35% more likely to have a risk factor for suicide, such as making a suicidal plan. Sleep experts say that teens should get about nine hours of sleep a night, and 57% more teens were sleep deprived in 2015 than in 1991. Teens who put down their smartphones an hour before bed gain an extra 21 minutes of sleep a night. Now, this is a really significant point because sleep is key to growth and well-being, and it's a conversation we're constantly having with young people about making sure they're getting enough sleep so they can function as a student. As staff at CAC over the last few years, we have been really looking into um, the latest research around the impact of social media on well-being and mental health in particular. Now, there is a clip that I would have liked to show you if we're in person that unfortunately I'm not able to show um, in this recording, but I do encourage you to go onto our psychology and counselling blog on the Hive and you will scroll down and you will see that there is um, the YouTube link or you can copy it from here to the Joe Rogan podcast. So you might seem think this is a bit of an unusual choice, but he interviewed Jonathan Haidt um, approximately two years ago, where the conversation was looking at the data in terms of the increases of symptoms of depression, self-harm and suicide, and connecting to the influence of social media. It's a really interesting conversation, and I do encourage you to go and take some time to check it out. Please know if you do go and watch the full um, podcast, there is some foul language, so I just prepare, I warn you uh, if you choose to watch this with your young people, but I really encourage you as parents to go and check it out yourself, and I welcome anyone come and have a conversation with me about it. Each year when we do this presentation, um, we like to read out this contract, this smartphone contract that was um, made quite popular online a couple of years ago. Look, I can't tell you exactly, exactly who wrote it, but it is some inspiration for parents about a potential way that you can approach and navigate setting some limits with your adolescent and their smartphone. It is a potential contract. Dear Gregory, Merry Christmas. You are now the proud owner of an iPhone. Hot damn, you are good and responsible for 13 year old boy and you deserve this gift. But with the acceptance of this present comes rules and regulations. So please read through the following contract. I hope you understand it is my job to raise you into a well-rounded, healthy young man that can function in the world and coexist with technology, not be ruled by it. Failure to comply with the following list will result in the termination of your iPhone ownership. I love you madly and look forward to sharing several million text messages with you in the days to come. What? It is my phone. I bought it. I pay for it. I'm loaning it to you. Aren't I the greatest? I will always know your password. If it rings, answer it. It is a phone. Say hello. Use your manners. Do not ever ignore a phone call if the screen reads mum or dad. Not ever. Hand the phone to one of your parents promptly at 7.30 every school night and every weekend night at 9pm. It will be shut off for the night and turned on again at 7.30am. If you would not make a call to someone's landline where their parents may answer first, then do not call and text. Listen to those instincts and respect other families like we would like to be respected. It does not go to school with you. Have a conversation with the people you text in person. It's a life skill. Half days, field trips and after school activities will require special consideration. If it falls into the toilet, smashes on the ground or vanishes into thin air, you are responsible for the replacement costs or repairs. Go mow a lawn, babysit, stash some birthday money. It will happen. You should be prepared. Do not use this technology to lie, fool or deceive another human being. Do not involve yourself in conversations that are hurtful to others. Be a good friend first or stay the heck out of the crossfire. Do not text, email or say anything through this device that you would not say in person. Do not text, email or say anything to someone that you would not say out loud with their parents in the room. Censor yourself. No porn. 
Search the web for information you would openly share with me. If you have a question about anything, ask a person, preferably me or your father. Turn it off, silence it, put it away in public, especially in a restaurant, at the movies, or while speaking to another human being. You are not a rude person. Do not allow the phone to change that. Do not send or receive pictures of your private parts or anyone else's private parts. Don't laugh. Someday you'll be tempted to do this despite your high intelligence. It is risky and could ruin your teenage, uni or adult life. It is always a bad idea. Cyberspace is a vast and more powerful thing than you. And it is hard to make anything of this magnitude disappear, including a bad reputation. Don't take a zillion pictures and videos. There is no need to document everything. Live your experiences. They will be stored in your memory for eternity. Leave your phone home sometimes and feel safe and secure in that decision. It is not alive or an extension of you. Learn to live without it. Be bigger and more powerful than FOMO, your fear of missing out. Download music that is new or classic or different to the millions of things that your peers listen to if it's all the exact same stuff. Your generation has access to music like never before in history. Take advantage of that gift and expand your horizons. Play a game with words or puzzles or brain teasers every now and again. Keep your eyes up. See the world that's happening around you. Stare out a window. Listen to the birds. Take a walk. Talk to a stranger. Wonder without actually Googling. You will mess up. I will take away your phone. We will sit down and talk about it. And we will start all over again. You and I, we're always learning. I'm on your team. We are in this together. It's my hope that you can agree to these terms. Most of the lessons listed here do not just apply to the iPhone, but to life. You are growing up in a fast and ever-changing world. It is exciting and enticing. Keep it simple every chance you get. Trust your powerful mind and giant heart above any machine. I love you. I hope you enjoy your awesome new phone. Merry Christmas, Mum. So if you would like a copy of that contract that you can use with your own adolescence, please reach out to me and I will happily send you a copy. Another area that parents of adolescents are navigating more and more is the online gaming space, or maybe not even necessarily online gaming, just gaming in general. Now, we know that gaming can be an incredible opportunity for creative problem solving, um, team building, Believe it or not, young people are actually making friends through gaming and sometimes are developing social peer networks through their gaming communities. And so while there is lots of really um, enjoyable, positive things that can come from gaming, when not done in moderation and when there's no limits, it can also be a challenge. Now, we know that excessive screen time can be problematic for young people. And so it is a challenge because so much of their education is actually screen based. So when we talk about limits of screen time, it's about the limits outside of what they're using for their education. So we do recommend that a two hours um, in addition to what they're doing for their learning is ideally the limit. Now, the where gaming can become a bit of a challenge. So this information here is from Cam Adair, who's an expert on gaming and potentially gaming addiction. And so looking at how gaming can cause dopamine, that joyful experience in the brain, chemical releases in the brain that give pleasure and joy, which can make it quite addictive. And it can have a overarching um, impact on the development and growth of the brain when it is done in an excessive manner. So um, if you wanted to look at some more information, like this could be a whole seminar in itself. So I encourage you to actually go and look up Cam Adair um, with his information related to gaming. And also there is an Australian organisation called Game Aware, which is actually a group that they are teachers and they are gaming experts and gaming coaches, but they also work in the field of helping do intervention for gaming addiction. There is some incredible resources available, so I encourage you to look up Cambodare and also GameAware.com.au to get more information around this and to help you uh, pick up some tips about setting limits so that gaming can be safe and a positive, enjoyable aspect of your teen's life. Um, but also, uh, another quick add, if you ever have concerns about particular games, 
the eSafety Commissioner, um, eSafety.gov.au has an incredible range of resources that you can look at at any time. And again, if you have questions or concerns, reach out to me. Um, there's a lot of information I can share with you. In this next section, we're going to look at some aspects of the adolescent brain and in particular looking at emotion regulation and control. We have learnt over the last decade or so that the brain actually takes much longer to fully grow and develop than we ever thought. So while um, schools have thought previously or would have thought that by the time you hit your late adolescence or your early 20s that the brain was fully grown, we actually know that that's now happening well and truly to late 20s, early 30s and the last part of the brain to grow is that frontal lobe. The part of the brain that is the responsible for critical evaluation and the part of the brain that can say, hey, is this actually a good idea? Or the one that can manage impulse control. It makes it a bit of a challenge because our teenage is essentially operating with an underdeveloped system to know when to regulate themselves. Because of this, our adolescents are functioning from a very instinctive level and they're often uh, going with their gut reactions, which as an adult, you might look at a situation and say, their response is completely unreasonable. But for that young person, their brain might not have picked up on the information and might not have the experience that you have to judge a situation the way that you have, but instead they're responding to it often from a very um, life or death, fight or flight situation and having quite immediate impulsive reactions because they are functioning from the central part of their brain, the feeling system, rather than the clear critical thinking system. As a result of this, sometimes what we see is a lot of impulsive choices and sometimes some pretty dodgy decisions that adolescents will make. But if you think back to when you were an adolescent, you can probably recall there were times when maybe you did things that you later thought perhaps it wasn't the greatest idea. But it's at this time that teenagers are taking more risks. They might say and do things that might be seemed a little bit inappropriate. They might have quite impulsive reactions to things. They might have quite intense emotional responses. This might be you might notice when perhaps you say no to something and you are the worst person in the world and right at that moment you are your adolescent's enemy. Um, and so often this re uh, results in a lot of miscommunication and it can be really hard for a teenager to pick up on subtle cues from other people in their environment when they're functioning at a very emotionally charged space. On the previous slide, you would have seen down in the corner, there was a um, cartoon representation of what it can be like on Instagram or social media sometimes with arrows in the face. And when we're talking about teenagers operating from a very emotionally charged space, this can be a bit of a problem when we incorporate social media because they have the capacity to respond to situations very quickly and they can have pretty big consequences by sending out their responses to others before they've actually had a chance to think about how they're feeling and to have a considered approach. So when we're seeing this example happen with those impulsive reactions, um, the hand model of the brain is probably one of the best ways to describe what happens. So Dr. Dan Siegel um, has orchestrated a way to explain impulsive reactions and how the brain responds when we have been triggered emotionally. So the idea here is that the hand literally represents the brain. So our fingertips being our prefrontal cortex, the thinking, rational problem solver part, and then our thumb and our palm here is our emotional deep seated just survival mode functioning part of our brain. And now when we are calm, our thinking and rational problem solver is hugging and nurturing and comforting and keeping control over our impulsive emotional um, part of our brain. However, what can happen sometimes is something will happen that will trigger us and then we flip our lid. And when we flip our lid, what actually happens is that our emotions become quite raw. That critical thinking problem solver is offline and now we're functioning from a very um, gut reaction, emotionally responsive space. And so as parents, you might be able to think of times when you have been frustrated or pushed by your adolescent or pre-adolescent and perhaps have flipped your own lid where suddenly 
you're no longer calm, you're not saying the things that you wish you would be saying, you are responding from a very frustrated, maybe angry, maybe disappointed space. And it can be not the most healing and not the most problem solving and not the most rational space to be. But that's okay, it happens because we're all human. We all flip our lid sometimes. But our teenagers tend to do this a lot more because that top part of their brain, the thing that can keep them regulated and in control, is still growing and still developing. So the next time you feel pushed by your adolescent, I want you to think, have I just flipped my lid? Because what I need to do is I need to step away and allow myself to calm for that rational part of my brain to come back online so that I can deal with this properly and to understand that the same thing is happening for your young person. So if you've both flipped your lid, no one's in control at that space. So sometimes it is good to go, hey, it's time for us to just part ways, go back to our corners and we will come back when we're calm and we can actually talk about this with some level of rational thinking. So this graphic here is just a really simple representation of what I've just shared with you. We use this graphic often um, with primary school age children. So perhaps you also have some primary school age children in your household. And it's that idea that our upstairs brain and our downstairs brain working together, sometimes working against each other. So when our upstairs brain is hugging our downstairs brain, we are calmer and making better choices. However, when we get our big feelings take over, We've flipped our lid and we might need a little bit of time to calm because perhaps the choices, the behaviour and the words we are sharing in that moment might not be the most helpful. So I encourage you to um, use that as a really good image to help you in your interactions with your kids. So we've talked about some of the challenges that you can face and some of those difficulties, but I think it's really important to reflect on what is referred to as the five core needs of childhood. So we might feel a huge amount of pressure as adults to provide everything to young people, but really it can be boiled down to these key areas for you to focus on to raise a well-rounded young person. And number one is about survival. It's about providing a safe and secure place to live. It's about making sure they have food in their bellies and a warm, safe bed to sleep in at night. Number two is really important. It's unconditional love. Our young people need to know that even though they are growing up and going to make a multitude of mistakes, and I guarantee you they will make the same mistakes many, many times, to know that regardless of the outcome of that, that they are intrinsically loved and valued and they know that there is a relationship of trust with their parents and they might be an absolute rat bag and get a detention, but they might come home and be in trouble, but they're still going to be loved and valued just the same. It's about helping them build autonomy. So autonomy is about teaching your young people to do things for themselves and being careful not to do too much for them because as they grow up, they're going to need to be able to be independent, to do things for themselves. And it might start with them learning how to tie their own shoelaces and then it might grow to being able to pack their own lunch boxes and eventually iron their own uniforms. But all these little steps is about helping build that personal capacity and autonomy. Um, number four is about the freedom to be a child, the freedom to just be little and to be able to play and not have adult worries, to be able to focus on what is developmentally appropriate for them and to be able to have times when they don't have the worries of the world on their shoulders. Now, this can be hard and especially at the moment, we are starting this school year with a lot of concerns and a lot of worries. We are in a pandemic and a lot of our young people are really feeling the pressure of that. And it has robbed them of some of that freedom just to, you know, not worry about things and share drinks with their friends and touch and get dirty. And we are really worried about hygiene, about health practices, but we need to still try and find that balance where they can just be kids as well. And they also very much need limits and boundaries. A young person who doesn't learn limits and boundaries is a young person who is going to really struggle to thrive in society because there always needs to be a sense of knowing how to regulate themselves, what's okay, and how to self-manage, which is something that we really try and impart here at the college through our raised responsibility system for discipline is around teaching young people that they need to take responsibility for their own choices and then they can also celebrate their own successes because they have contributed to that. 
A couple of key important things that adolescents need is a good relationship with at least one adult, ideally more than that. So with parents, teachers, support staff, coaches, um, mentors, people that they can go to that they trust. They also really need an, a parent who will hang on to their adult self when they're interacting with them. Going back to that um, flipping your lid in the hand model of the brain, that when your young person comes to you with an issue that you can sit back and hold on to that experience and wisdom that you have. Sometimes it's just about listening and validating, but other times going, okay, even though this situation frustrates me, I'm going to hang on to my calm and be able to respond in a way that's going to help them. They need to be listened to and they need to have their, their opinions heard, even if they might seem completely ridiculous at times. They need for you to hear it, to respond and to interact with that and to take on so you can try and understand where they're coming from because if you don't understand where they're coming from, it's going to be very hard to shift them if perhaps where they're coming from is not very helpful. So it's about being able to also spend time together to build that relationship. You know, I encourage families to cook meals together. You know, get your young person, adolescents, they are not always great at the face-to-face -face conversation. So sometimes the side-by-side -side conversation can be really helpful. So say, you know, in a car, phones down and have those side-by-side -side chats that don't feel as confronting because you're not having to eyeball each other. You know, when you're in the kitchen, get them to chop veggies, ask them how their day was, where they're not having to look at you and they've got something to focus on. So it makes it a little bit less confronting. Um, if your conversations are only about, you know, their schoolwork or what they haven't done or their chores and or issues, it's going to make it really hard. So make sure that the, there's a bit of a balance in the conversations. Yes, it is your role as a parent to pull them up on things and to make sure they do the things they have to do, but also just to stop and take an interest and to enjoy each other's company too. I've just got a couple of cartoons here that will hopefully give you um, a little bit of a giggle, but just I guess for you to do a little bit of self-reflection. You might uh, see that image of the helicopter mum and go, oh my gosh, that is so me. Oh, I know someone like that. Or the, the new reference that we use instead of helicopter is the lawnmower, the person who completely clears every obstacle out of the way before their child has to face it. Now, we need to be really mindful of this because part of our responsibility of educating and developing well-rounded young people is to help them learn how to take responsibility for themselves. If they forget, they're in high school now, if they forget their HPE uniform, you don't need to drive it in. You can let them get an infringement and they will learn from that infringement, you know what, I probably need to be a little bit more organized and know when I have PE so that I don't forget my PE uniform on that day. Here's just another um, couple of cartoons that we like to use as part of this. And again, it's just about us taking stock as adults and going, okay, what are we doing? And are we doing the best to help our adolescents take responsibility for themselves and develop maturity to understand that, hey, we can't do everything for you. What happens here now that you're in high school, a big, big part of that is all about your responsibility and what you are doing and what are you getting out of the situation. It's really tough as parents to know when to let go. And now that you all have at least one high school student, you're facing this time where it's about learning how to slowly let go of the reins because they're not little kids anymore. And that can be a really hard process to go through and to know how to do that well. And so the um, analogy we like to use is about imagining you're riding a horse and it's about letting out the reins gradually so that they slowly have increasing levels of control and independence of what they're doing rather than just dropping the reins altogether and losing control of the situation. It's just about gently allowing more and more independence as you go. Okay, so how do we actually do that? It can be a really tricky thing to know how to do that. So a good place is to allow your young people to take risks inside the family. Um, Young people will start to challenge you, but it is your opportunity in this space to teach them how to negotiate, how to um, wear the consequences of the choices that they make, but also to slowly guide them through conversations around, okay, these are the potential consequences of this situation. If you do that, I might not agree, you might choose to do it. The consequences might be that you're in big trouble with me or there might be some natural consequences. 
And it can be really important when you're dealing with an adolescent to try to avoid getting sucked into that head on battle because often no one's winning in that situation. Everyone's just getting frustrated. So the goal is about learning how to negotiate and compromise. The older your adolescent gets, the more you have to be willing to negotiate because that's how they are learning and that's how they're going to learn life skills in other relationships that they have with their friends, with their um, romantic partners, with bosses and with colleagues. It's about learning how to plan, negotiate and problem solve with other people so that they can over time learn to regulate, okay, what is the right thing for me to do in this situation? I'm almost at the end of this presentation for you today, but I hope you'll bear with me as I read to you a letter um, that I came across a few years ago that I think is really important. It was a letter written um, from the perspective of a teenager speaking to their parent about what this time is like for them. And I really encourage you just to either read along with me or just to listen. Dear parent, this is the letter I wish I could write. This fight we are in right now, I need it. I need this fight. I can't tell you this because I don't have the language for it and it wouldn't make sense anyway, but I need this fight badly. I need to hate you right now and I need you to survive it. I need you to survive my hating you and you hating me. I need this fight even though I hate it too. It doesn't matter what this fight is even about. It's curfew, homework, laundry, my messy room, going out, staying in, leaving, not leaving, boyfriends, girlfriends, no friends, bad friends. It doesn't matter. I need to fight you on it and I need you to fight me back. I desperately need you to hold the other end of the rope, to hang on tightly while I thrash on the other end, while I find the handholds and footholds in this new world I feel like I am in. I used to know who I was, who you were, who we were, but right now I don't. Right now, I'm looking for my edges and I can sometimes only find them when I'm pulling on you. When I push everything I used to know to its edge, then I feel like I exist and for a minute I can breathe. I know you long for the sweeter kid I was. I know this because I long for that too. And some of that longing is what is so painful for me right now. I need this fight and I need to see that no matter how bad or big my feelings are, they won't destroy you or me. I need you to love me even at my worst, even when it looks like I don't love you. I need you to love yourself and me for the both of us right now. I know it sucks to be disliked and labelled the bad guy. I feel that same way on the inside, but I need you to tolerate it and get other grown-ups to help you because I can't right now. I want you to get all of your grown-up friends together and have a surviving your teenager support group rage fest and that's fine with me. Or talk about me behind my back. I don't care. Just don't give up on me and don't give up on this fight. I need it. This is the fight that will teach me that my shadow is not bigger than my light. This is the fight that will teach me that bad feelings don't mean the end of a relationship. This is the fight that will teach me how to listen to myself, even when it might disappoint others. And this particular fight will end. Like any storm, it will blow over and I will forget and you will forget and then it will come back. And I will need you to hang on to that rope again. And I will need this over and over for years. I know there's nothing inherently satisfying in this job for you. I know I will likely never thank you for it or even acknowledge your side of it. In fact, I'll probably criticize you for all of this hard work. It will seem like nothing you do will be enough. And yet I'm relying entirely on your ability to stay in this fight. No matter how much I argue, no matter how much I sulk, no matter how silent I get, please hang on to the other end of the rope and know that you are doing the most important job that anyone could possibly be doing for me right now. Love, your teenager. So, to wrap up, no matter how tough it gets, Try your best to hold on to your adult self and relinquish control gradually. Discuss rules collaboratively. Choose your battles wisely. 
model responsible processes as much as you can, provide acceptable choices, acknowledge the good bits, ignore some of the bad bits, actively listen to their views, communicate openly, sometimes while chopping carrots, try where you can to avoid bringing up too many past mistakes, and also don't forget to encourage some outdoor activities. Your child is now an adolescent, so they're not actually a child anymore. So now it's about changing the relationship and working on really building a positive relationship because they are essentially a budding adult. And so it is normal for them to change and be erratic and suddenly, and actually sometimes to change quite suddenly. And throughout this time, the changes will be sometimes unpredictable and sometimes you'll see them coming from a mile away. But the most important thing is you try where possible to remain calm and just be that predictable, stable self to know your boundaries. And also a messy room is okay. Sometimes um, to survive adolescence, and I don't mean surviving being an adolescent, I mean as a parent to survive having adolescence, sometimes we need to not sweat the small stuff and some things we can let slide and it's okay. So try to zero in on the qualities you really want them to develop and be careful not to be too fixated on just their grades and achievement. I mean, that is important, but it's about helping them grow up to be decent, responsible human beings. And it's about having sometimes that mindset about trying hard and taking um, pride in what we do and putting in effort in things and being kind. And these are some of those incredible attributes we really want to see develop in our young people. So at the college, the focus that we take when helping um, develop and shape young people is that we like to work on building them from a mind, heart, soul, strength perspective. And it's about looking at flourishing from a whole person perspective. And it would be an incredible opportunity for actually for you to pause um, the video right now and take a look at this flourishing framework because I think it can actually relate so well to your role as parents so that we're working together with a similar focus and it's all about growing and developing incredible young people. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, joining me in this presentation today. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you live so that this could be a bit more of a conversation, um, which is my preference. But at the same time, I would love to have any questions that you have directed towards me. I look forward to getting to know some of you um, more in the coming weeks, months and terms and years. And so it's been a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. I really look forward to getting to know your year seven students as they are now up here in high school on the secondary campus. And I hope you all have an incredible day and look forward to having some very exciting conversations when they all come home. Take care.